Hello, everybody. You figured it out. Good I job. I figured it out. Okay. Hi, guys. Hello, hello. See. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it is working. Okay, okay, okay. So, um, hold on. Let me clean my screen. Okay. Um, okay, so let me send it to some people. And then we can get the party started. Mm -hmm. Um, can do the same thing. Yeah. Wow, they're gonna be so annoyed because all these people are like in the same group chats. Okay, <laughs> say love you. Okay. Hello, have have dot t. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think I sent it to enough people for now. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. So actually, Danny, before we even start, let me put this mm -hmm. in episode one. Hold on. Okay, so now, oh, I think you have to pin it. I can't pin con I comments. Have to pin it. Let's yeah. see. Let's see if uh, pin comment. Ha ha. You got it. Yeah. But it's not pinned though. It says it's pinned for me. I can't see comments. So are there comments right now? This is so weird. Yeah, there's comments. Everyone's saying hello, Fabu. I can't see anything. Oh, no. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I think we're good. We're close to 40, um, 40 viewers. Hold on one second. And then I'll give you a grand introduction. Okay. Okay. All right, guys. So... Welcome to Tariq Time. Um, this is Memher Dani, Canada's <laughs> very own historian. Uh, he's going to go through, what are we talking about today, Dani? We're just going through like the general history of Tigray today, just as a, just as a start. General history. Okay. So they, they have to wait to see the details? Yeah. Yeah. In the next coming Tariq Time episodes. Okay. All right, so that's what we're going to do. Um, I'm not going to stay on. I don't want to fool any of you guys. I'm not a historian like Danny. So I'm just doing the introduction. And then... Let's just uh, be clear. I'm not a historian either. I'm, I'm just like an amateur enthusiast. Yeah, I call him, I call him a historian. Uh, <laughs> but um, he knows much more than me. So yeah, I'm just going to do the introductions. And then I'll hop off. And um, some of you guys who are on Clubhouse know Uncle uncle uh he will be on here too co-hosting with with memher danny so stay tuned it's gonna be a very fun episode uh if they if they don't talk about something that you have like a burning question about just drop your questions in the comment section and um or in the question box let me see is there even a question can you can they see question box i don't know if they'll answer you but uh, yeah can you guys see one is there one oopsie daisy Almost dropped my phone there. Let's see. Yeah, I'm not sure. Let me know. I can't see comments, so let me what, let me know what the people in the comments say. Yeah, some someone in the comments tell me that yes, they say yes. There is a co uh, question box. Okay. Okay. Cool. cool. Okay. So yeah, guys, if you have questions, put them in the question box or the comments. Uh, Uncle will be. Let me send this actually to him. I'm not sure if he's even in here. Oh boy. I can remember his at. Uh oh. Anyways, we'll figure it out. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's gonna be fun, guys. It's gonna be really fun. Um, what was the other thing? Oh yeah, I wanted to say. So these guys, like, they take a lot of time out of their life because they're really interested in history. They do a lot of research. It's not like you know, 
a lot of us who uh who you know we talk to our parents and our friends and like that's the extent of the history that we know so i'm no shame to that either i mean i'm definitely in that boat um up until just a little while ago so but anyways yeah that's why we're here you know um obviously what's going on back home uh is like horrible and so a lot of us uh we wish we knew a lot more of our history before this but it is what it is we're here now we're gonna learn today and every second sunday so yeah mm -hmm. i think that's it maybe uncle if you're in the comments can you uh can you request to join i think danny will see the request even mm -hmm. before i hop off Let me see if I can add it to him. Is everybody excited? I mean, I'm really excited and I'm not even doing the lessons, so. <laughs> Let's see. Oh. Hello, Miss Lul. Oh, that's another one of Ottawa's finest. Ottawa's finest. Sion Tekle. Herit Mbaye. I don't know if I said that correctly. Heriti. Oh, Heriti. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, we got Tagaro link up in here. Okay. Oh. Lili. Shout out to Lili. Oh my God. Why can't I find? He hasn't requested to join yet. No, no, I haven't gotten any requests yet. Hold on. I will find it. Hiab. Hopefully I said that correctly as well. Oh, thank you, Fana. She just messaged me something very useful. Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay. All right. Okay, I sent it to him. Okay, guys. So what's everybody excited for? I can't read the comments. So Danny, you're gonna have to tell me. But Yeah, right, right in the comments what you guys are excited for. Uh... I'm so annoyed. I can't. Oh, I see. He's saying he can't. Okay, uncle, get get out and come back in and you'll see the request button. I, I have it on my laptop now because I'm so thirsty to read the comments. But <laughs> I see what she said. She's going to go post it and come back. Okay. That's great. Oh. Okay. So, yeah. Anyway. So, uh, what? Are, okay. Read me what the comments are saying. There's, you know, it's just people um, were excited to hear more about Queen of Shiva. Okay, Fana. I see you. <laughs> yeah. Because you said something very outrageous to us in our group. So, I mean, you could let them know while we wait for Uncle to come. You can even tell them. Oh, what we're, we're starting off with controversy? Okay. I mean, you're well, pretty certain. Let, let's see. How do I frame this in a way that's both quick and not super uh, controversial? Um. Essentially, the Kebra Nagast, or the glory of the kings in English, is a, you know, in the scholarly point of view, is a fabrication from the Shoan kings who became kings in 1270 after the Zagwe dynasty was uh, overthrown. Mm -hmm. And it was used to justify their rule. I mean, you people probably just got so confused with what you said. Long story short, just, mm -hmm. that was intentional, right? Okay. Well, okay, I'll try to be as clear <laughs> as possible. Okay, okay. Anyways, we're not gonna let them know about that yet. We don't want. Them I to know that was a lot in a little bit of time. Okay, I'm gonna go. Um, just you try and request him the same way you requested me because I don't know he's having issues. Okay, well, do you yeah, remember the app? It. Do you, um, Do you remember who to send it to? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay, bye. See everybody in the comments. All right. We're going to try and get uh, Uncle in here. Yeah, if it doesn't work, I'll come back. Okay. Oh, there you go.
I sent you the request, Uncle. Oh, look who it is. <laughs> what's going on? What's going on? What's up? Nothing. Already. Oh, man. How's everything with you guys? <laughs> okay. So I'm just going to go over, like, I guess I'll call it our program. Um, it's nothing that crazy. I'm just going to go over the general history of Tigray, starting with, like, the, the pre-Aksumite pyramid, period. Um, and then after that, I'm going to be answering um, some questions that we had uh, sent to United Tagaru of Canada. Just some brief uh, questions. And then if you have questions, uh, either type them in the chat or put them in the question box. And then me and uh, Uncle will go from there. All righty. Okay, so starting from the beginning, we, there's uh, the earliest period of Tigrayan history is essentially a, a sort of unknown period. We don't know a lot about it. Um, and so this is roughly anything past 3,000 years ago. So anything beyond that, it's kind of hazy and we don't have a good idea of what was happening. We do know about the, the land of Punt. So I'm going to talk about that briefly. Um, so the land of Punt was referred to by the Egyptians and they would go there to go trade. And um, I think we have records of their trade with Punt from roughly 3,500 years ago to 2,800-ish. And they refer to it as God's land. We don't know exactly what they meant by that, but there's some speculation that when they said God land, God's land, it was like, you know, a sort of godly land or their, their, the land of their origins. That's what some people think. And um, the land of Punt was known for um, trading incense and ivory and all kinds of stuff to the Egyptians. And there's speculation um, that it was in modern day Tigray and Eritrea. And there's been different um, studies done. They did, uh, they, at some point, I think they found baboons, mummified baboons in Egypt. Uncle knows what I'm talking about already. Mm -hmm. yeah, that were um, DNA tested and found to be more similar to the ones in Tigray and Eritrea rather than the ones in Somalia and Yemen, which were considered to be possible locations of Punt. And Here's another really interesting thing. This is something I discovered that like blew my mind. So let me ask you, Uncle, have you ever heard of any sort of talk of snake worship in pre-Christian Tigray? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Yes. Sam, okay. <laughs> tell, tell us what you know. So um, the first story we hear uh, is with the Queen of Sheba story. Uh, of course, you know, that's very contested whether it's historical or not. But nevertheless, there's talk of uh, being descendants of the snake god. Um, but something a little more closer to natural history, we see with Awana Aragawi. So when Awana Aragawi goes to Devradamo, he's talking about the people that uh, in, the, in the area worshipping the snake. Uh, they call it Gabbal, which is a bigger snake, to, to say the least. And also in many other parts of uh, Tigray as well. And uh, even with the image and the history of Awana Aragawi, you see the, the snake bringing Awana Aragawi up to the top of the mountain. And we kind of see this um, replication of the Abraham story of I don't worship the sun, but the God that worships, uh, the, but the God that created the sun. In the same way, we see Awana Aragawi saying, "I don't worship the snake, but the God that can command the snake." Uh, so we do, we do see it there. Um, and just to to tie into that, there's um, I think several records in the late eighth, ninth, and tenth centuries that show that priests were sent to modern day Tigray to exterminate the cult of the snake, is what they called it. The cult yeah. of the serpent. Yeah, that's it as well. And this is, this is what blew my mind. This is what I was talking about earlier. There's an old story. I think it's the oldest ancient Egyptian story ever written down. That's uh, and it's called the tale of the shipwrecked sailor. So it's the story of an Egyptian sailor who's sailing to go find you know goods and stuff like that. I'm being very brief with it. There's it's a little bit more in depth, but um, he gets shipwrecked on an island. And eventually a giant serpent comes and helps him out and brings him food and stuff like that. And, you know, helps him survive on the island. Um, and eventually he's able to, you know, create a raft or something to get back to Egypt. 
and he tells the 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 giant snake, "Thank you so much. You know, I I would uh, love to go back to uh, my land in Egypt and tell the Pharaoh that you helped me, and then you know he'll reward you." And the snake laughs at him, and he says, "I am the king of Punt, and I am richer than anyone. I know. I'm going to show you this later." When I read this, I was mm -hmm. like, "Oh my god!" Mm -hmm. So we have records. We know there's there used to be snake worship in Tigray. We know there's speculation that the land of Punt was in Tigray. And now we have an ancient Egyptian story that talks about an Egyptian sailor going to the land of Punt and meeting a giant snake that declares itself to be the king of Punt. So that's an interesting connection that we find. Um, is there anything you want to add before we, we move on to the next uh, section about this area, uh, Uncle? Yeah, just also with the, the, even to the way we dance today, we, mm -hmm. we make the same sound as a snake. So when we dance in Tigrinya, we say, S -s 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 -s. Oh. So it, it kind of ties in with that as well. Interesting. Um, okay, so now we're going to get into, this is still ancient pre but it's a little bit more defined. So this is the kingdom of, I'm calling it Diamat, but from what I've seen, there's no consensus on how it's properly pronounced because they only, mm -hmm. they didn't have the vowels back then. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so they, it was a DMT, and some people say Diamat, some people say Damat. But um, essentially, and again, I'm being very brief, the capital was likely Yeha. They worshipped Semitic gods, the chief one among them being Almaka. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that properly. Um, and we don't know currently whether that kingdom um, ended or it evolved into Aksum or if it, if it mm -hmm. turned into a smaller state that was absorbed into Aksum. We don't know. That period is very, very hazy. So that's really all we have for now. Um, Uncle, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, no, I, that's the spot on, spot on. So it's it's really an unknown. But mm -hmm. we do understand that there are city-states and uh, even the very concept of uh, the Aurajas, we, we do see it in the inscriptions. So, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. All right. So then the next period we get to is the Aksumite period. This period is like the opposite of the Diyama period where there's almost too much information to get into. So we're going to be brief just... Because later on, in the next uh, few lives we do, we'll, we'll go into more depth. But um, the accepted start date is 80 BCE. So that's before Common Era. So that's 80 years before, you know, year one, right? And then um, there's a lot of contention about when it ended, but people generally say 10th century, around 900 something. Um, so it started off as a kingdom that was heavily involved in trade. And it allowed that, that allowed it to expand and become one of the largest empires at the time in roughly the 3rd, 4th century. So at the height of this, uh, the Aksumai Empire, it controlled modern-day Tigray, Eritrea, parts of Sudan, western Yemen, and parts of Saudi Arabia. And it controlled both sides of the Red Sea. Like if this is the Red Sea, and we have Tigray and Eritrea here, and Yemen here, if you wanted to travel right, to India or China to get spices, you had to go through Aksum and you had to pay your taxes, right? So that's why they were that powerful, okay? And um, at different periods of time, you, we can see that they invaded what is modern-day Yemen and conquered them and things like that. That's just sort of like the brief, very, very, very brief history of Aksum. Um, Uncle, anything interesting you want to add? Uh, yeah, just as you said, as you mentioned earlier with, uh, with Yaha and uh, Diamat. Uh, mm -hmm. We see the principal god that was uh, worshipped amongst the South Arabians also in uh, in the area. And also during that period, you, still, you see the inscriptions of the same language, Sabayan. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I'm not really too sure how that how that's pronounced either. Some people say Sabayan uh, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So you do see like a cultural uh, back and forth between the two peoples. So yeah. that still continues even up until the Aksumite period. And just tying into that, I think Aksum converted to... Christianity, one of the earliest nations to convert to Christianity. I think technically the Armenians have us beat. Yeah, <laughs> by a few I years. Looked by it a few up. years. Yeah. yeah, but if it's, and when you say a few, it's really like a few. It's like 10 or something, 10 years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, um, and you can see that. It's really interesting. You can see that on the coinage of Aksum. So we have coins where in Izan Azrain, it um, on one side, I don't remember what's on one side. I think it's a picture of wheat or something. Yeah, wheat and the crescent moon. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and the correct. crescent moon, that's the religious um, symbol because we used mm -hmm. to worship moons and suns and stuff like that. Then once he converts to Christianity, we see that instead of the crescent moon, it's a cross. 
So we have actual proof of when uh, um, Aksum converted to Christianity. Um, okay, and then uh, roughly starting the 6th, 7th century, we see the Aksumite Empire begins to decline. And there's many, many factors. So there's climate change, deforestation, the rise of Islam, all these sorts of things. Um, and then after that, we get a short dark age. And then we get the Zagwe dynasty. This is where things start to get a little bit interesting. So this period is also a little bit dark and hazy. Um, we know it started roughly the 10th century and was ended in 1270 by Yukuno Amlak. Um, there, there isn't a, a consensus on, on the rise of the Zagwe dynasty and where exactly they came from. There's different stories. I, I'd, I'd be glad to get into that at some point. Um, and what else? Yeah, there's not that much. The Zagwe were, just for those of you who aren't aware, actually, Uncle, do you want to tell them? Yeah, so the Zagwe dynasty was a, a Cushitic or Ago-speaking uh, dynasty that uh, maintained and retained the Aksumite culture, but um, didn't receive the acceptance of uh, not only the church, but the people as well. So you mm -hmm. see Aksumites uh, or the Tigrayans not accepting them as kings. The, even the Egyptian church not sending bishops because yep. they didn't see them as uh, being uh, true heirs of the, of the throne. Mm -hmm. um, although they are accredited with uh, the Lalibela churches and whatnot, the dating for those churches is, is still relatively unknown. Um, mm -hmm. But then the traditional uh, history of the Zagwe dynasty is that you get this character, Mara Taklaimanoth, who, who marries the, 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 the last, I guess, daughter of the, the kings. I believe it was Dinna Ur, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, claims the throne of uh, being uh, a descendant of Moses and uh, his, his Ethiopian wife. So that was, that was the claim to fame for the, the Zagwes. But uh, we're going to hear from you. Um, that's, that's exactly right. Awesome. Um, so then after that, in 1270, we get the Shawan dynasty also known as the Solomonica dynasty, who took power in 1270 through Yakuno Amlak. Um, and essentially, that's the, I don't know if everyone knows where Showa is today. It's like modern day Eastern Amhara. And so they took power and claimed to be the direct descendants of uh, the Aksumite Empire. I'm a little, you know, no, I'm not super convinced, <laughs> but Same. you know we we, yeah. <laughs> we don't need to get too deep yeah. into that right now. Yeah. Better not to, better not to for sure. I wish if you guys can put this on YouTube. That's a great idea, and that's probably something we should work on. Um, yeah, well maybe we can save this live if someone can. This is my first live ever, so I don't know how we'll do that. But if we can save this live somehow, and and maybe figure out what to do. Supposedly descendants. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, after that, that's roughly um, from the 1300s till now is, there isn't really a name for it. Um, I, would, I would just call it, I guess, the medieval history of Tigray. And that's when Tigray's history is really um, interwoven with that of uh, Ethiopia and the surrounding areas. That's when Tigray stops looking towards the Middle East and, you know, Sudan as... Um, its way of entering into the world and, and starts to sort of look southward and inward. Um, and there's a lot of interesting things that uh, uh, go on at that point. And I'm just going to list off a bunch of stuff and then, you know, uncle can go. So, you know, we have, um, we have a rebellion. A lot of people don't know a rebellion in the 14th and 15th century that was squashed. We have a rebellion in the 13th century in Inderta, where the ruler of Inderta started calling himself the keeper of the whisks essentially saying to the Shawan king, which is an old, old Aksumite title, and saying mm -hmm. to the Shawan king, I don't believe in you. I don't know what you're on about. Sorry, that's my this, wire. My, my... Oh, no. No um, what else do we have? We have um, the Shawan uh, dynasty uh, going to war with the Sultanate of Adal. Had devastating war. We have the Oromo invasions. We have at a certain point called the Zemana Misafint, which means the era of the princes, which is very, very important. And we see different um, rulers from across Ethiopia, Tigray, modern-day Amhara, modern-day Oromia, um, fighting for power. And um, yeah, that's, again, very, very brief, because this period of... This is a thing that a lot of people don't realize. Our history 
is so interesting. It is so interesting. It's so rich. And the past just 700 years is kind of like our own personal Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? There's different houses and dynasties and marriages and old grudges and all kinds of stuff that this should all be like, I wish someone would write a book or something like that. But um, mm -hmm. is there anything else interesting about this period you'd like to share, uh, Uncle? Um, no, I mean, like you hit all the major points. Uh, of course, the 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 fighting with the show ends amongst uh, pretty much all sides of the uh, Ethiopia, uh, probably, uh, uh, modern day Ethiopia. The mm -hmm. uprisings in Tigray going as far back as the 13th century till today, showing kind of like this uh, self-ruling culture of the Tigrayans, and uh, and not really falling under the the titles of like the king of kings or and whatnot. You you never really get a king of Tigray. There was never really a Nagus after the uh, Solomonic uh, emperors, mm -hmm. so it, it kind of goes to show the uh, the separation in terms of uh, of politics or or rulership mm -hmm. or rulership uh, in the region. But yeah, yeah. That, you, you hit everything on the, on the bottom. And that's that's a great point that a lot of people don't realize is once the Shoan dynasty came into control, if you look at the history of Tigray, Tigray was largely autonomous, part of the Ethiopian Empire, but not interfered with generally. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the rulers of Tigray were always people from Tigray. There's only a handful of times in that time period where it was a non tigrayan who ruled. I think in the 19th century, Ras Wube Haile Mariam yeah. ruled Tigray in Semien. He was from, uh, I don't remember, somewhere in Amhara. I don't remember whether it's Gondar or Godjam. I think yeah, Gondar. No, yeah, Northern Gondar. Northern Gondar. Northern Gondar, okay. Yeah. Um, and then I think there's one other I'm forgetting. Oh, this is quite modern. And I think roughly around the time of World War One, 1914-ish. I don't know if you know the date. You can tell me. Mm -hmm. um, Mikhail Ali of Wollo yes, yes, yes. declared the king of Tigray. Yeah. Yeah. So those are the only two times, and both times mm -hmm. are not fondly remembered in Tigray. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very, very, very mm -hmm. much so. Yeah. Okay, so for this next part, what I'm going to do is answer some questions. Um, we had a little story on United Tagaru of Canada um, asking if people wanted to uh, ask some questions. So there, I'm going to answer some of these questions and then uh, maybe Uncle can chime in and let us know because I'm going to be very brief because some of these topics are really wide. So some people wanted to know about, I, and I'm going to probably pronounce this wrong, please correct me, Ras Sabagadis? Yeah, Deja Sabagadis. Yeah, Deja Sabagadis, yeah. who was, um, and I'm going to be very brief here, he was the Shum of Agame. Mm -hmm. I believe he was Irog. Was he not Irog? Yes, yes, he was. He was. Okay, he was Irog. Um, and he became the Shum of Agame after... Uh, no, he became the warlord of Tigray after mm -hmm. Ra Rasp Walde Salase. Correct, correct, correct. In 1822, he made Adigrat's mm -hmm. capital. Mm -hmm. And his castle still... Last time I was there was two, three years ago. His castle was still there. It's in very, very bad shape. People have yeah. taken the stones out of it to build their houses. Um, but he was one of the first Ethiopians to build friendly relationships with uh, Europeans because he understood kind of the dynamics going on at that time. Um, and he really, really wanted to remove the Yeju Oromo, the Yeju clans of Oromo, from power because they were in power uh, at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and his descendants ruled Agame until the 1974 revolution. Any, anything else you got? Yeah, very true. So also uh, with Dajat Wubi, uh, yeah, he's actually from Walkait. Uh, I mean, uh, we made a mistake. Wubi Halamariam? Wubi Halamariam, yeah, or from that okay. area. Um, mm -hmm. His his wife, or, or one of his wives, was the daughter of Dajat Sawagadis. Oh. Uh, yeah, so that that was quite interesting. And also he he ruled everything between uh, the, the Red Sea and Gondar. Uh, mm -hmm. his, his power, his, yeah. his power in terms of that. Right before becoming crowned, or at least he, he tried to be uh, crowned king, uh, mm -hmm. So there's a church called Dereske Mariam uh, in mm -hmm. present-day Semen Gondar. And um, unfor fortunately or unfortunately, uh, right before being crowned as the Bishop uh, Awana Salama III, I believe, came, uh, he fought with, I, I believe, Deja or Ras Kasa. Uh, mm -hmm. so, and Ras Kasa would, uh, would defeat Deja Tobi and become uh, Atsi Tedros II. Mm -hmm. uh, thus uh, concluding the Zemana Masafan. So, yes. Um, yeah, which, which is quite interesting. Also, uh, Atsi Johannes, 
uh, is a descendant of the uh, sister of the Jaswa goddess or the daughter of Shumagama Waldo. So that's part of how he was uh, accepted into Tigray as the first real I don't know how to a genuine king of Tigray in a long time because he was descended from many of the different royal families yeah. from different parts of Tigray. You know there's there's on uh, sort of like Adwa family then mm-hmm. Derta Tembien he himself was the Shum Tembien mm-hmm. Agame and so on. Um let's see. So that's what we got for that. Um if hopefully at some point in the future we can go into more detail about uh, Sabagadis. Um let's see. Archaeological discoveries in Tigray. Someone asked about that. Someone said I think Aksum and I just decided to make it about Tigray because there's some really cool stuff. So um there's Beit Samati. Okay. I don't know. I think we're in in Woro area I think. I think so, yeah. Um and so this is a city that they discovered a few years ago that I think is roughly 1400ish years old. Mm-hmm. And uh it revealed some really interesting important stuff. The, the past few years has been amazing. Before the war started, we were discovering all kinds of crazy new stuff in in Tigray. Like it felt like every few months there was something new they were discovering. Mm-hmm. But this place, Beit Samati, The biggest discovery was a massive building 60 feet long and 40 feet wide resembling the ancient Roman style of a basilica built in the Okay, 4th century. I I believe this is in Adwa, just north of Adwa. Okay, just north of Adwa. So. Okay. Yeah. Um so this basilica style that which was originally a Roman style was adopted by Christians around that time. So this confirms furthermore that we know that the Aksumites converted in the 4th century, so in the 300s. And um They also found a diverse array of goods from gold, uh, a carnelian ring. There's a picture of the ring. It looks like a ruby, like a ring with a big red uh mm-hmm. precious gem in the middle. Um they found a ring with uh, an image of a bull's head and nearly 50 cattle uh, figurines. So people think that's evidence of a pre-Christian religion which they call the cattle cult that we don't know that much about that probably existed in Tigray. So there's that uh there's Beit Samati. Next one up is Maya Drasha. Have you heard of Maya Drasha? Maya Drasha. I want to say it's in Shere area, I believe. I'm not exactly. too sure. Exactly, yeah. yeah. It's in Shere area. So this is an under there's not a lot of info because they're still studying it. Mm-hmm. The UCLA did and they did go to Maya Drasha. Um I am Sereni, I think it. Um so Maya Drasha is a city they found underground. It wasn't originally underground. It, it happened like that over time with erosion and such. But it's 3200 years old. Really, three thousand two hundred year old city. Mm-hmm. So it's and when they say city, they mean city. So you can see the houses, blah blah blah, street stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and what that tells us is that pushes back the date of civilization as we know it in Tigray. So mm-hmm. because usually the ceiling is two thousand eight hundred years ago, because that's what we know. We see all mm-hmm. the stuff at Yeha and Wukro and all that stuff. But a 3200 year old city pushes things back by at least 400 years. And even past possibly before the semeticization of northern Ethiopia and Eritrea. So that's really interesting because if you have a city what that tells you is the surrounding areas you can't have a city just on its own. Cities don't produce food, mm. right? So if there's a city that means there has to be people in the surrounding areas supplying it with food that means there's a certain amount of trade a certain amount of cultural development that existed to mm-hmm. support that city so that's a really interesting um discovery there really isn't much info on it because it's very new there and i i think most of the expeditions have been halted recently obviously um and then next up is another really cool one there's a temple near or in wukro i don't know if it's in it i think it's around it Uh, and the cow um, or I think that's it. Mm-hmm. And it's it's um a temple it's the third temple found in Tigray with dedicated to Almaka. Mm-hmm. And this is the really cool thing about this one. There's an inscription in ancient epigraphic South Arabian that refers to the temple of Yeha. Mhm. In written form it says it says Yeha. So mm-hmm. this on its own is really interesting because We know that that area the only reason they called it the Temple of Yeha beforehand is because that's what the locals call it. They just say this area is Yeha, so that's the temple. It's a church now, I believe. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, correct. I want to add a. It was a monastery actually initially. Okay. Uh, so one of the nine saints, including of course, I want Aragawi, I want Garima, I want Ali, I want Likanos. I want to add was one of them. So the uh, the temple that was in Yaha was converted to a church. Mm-hmm. So I want to add a church. But um, thank you very much. Um, mm-hmm. The fact that it refers to it as the temple of Yaha, this is this seems insignificant, but it's not. The locals there have been calling that place by the same name for at least 2,800 years. Mm-hmm. Think about that level of continuity. Mm-hmm. So that, that's something really interesting on its own. Tigray, the really cool thing about Tigray is that the whole country is like uh, an archaeological dig site. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, sorry, I'm looking at the comments. Um, my grandma even told me Whenever they were digging for new houses, they live in a place just outside of uh, Adigrat, a village like two hours away. So they would start to dig to build a foundation or just uh, not to build a foundation, sorry, to start uh, tilling new land. They would find pots, old earthenware pots, old, old. And they would find stuff inside it still, like stuff that had obviously gone bad, but they think it was butter or honey or something. And they wouldn't know what to do with it because they're just farmers and they just, you know... Or if the pot's still good, they still use it. Mm-hmm. But no matter where you dig, this is what they were starting to find, is there's a central sort of area, Adwa, Agame, Aksum, Tembien, I think those main ones, and even they're starting to discover Shireno, no matter where you go, you're going to find something, basically. Because mm-hmm. the area has been populated for so long. Um, yeah, that's the general history of, uh, of, uh, sorry, those are the archaeological discoveries. That's the question I was answering. Anything you want to add while I look at the next question? Uh, no, I mean, you, you, you've had a lot of it on, uh, on your mail, <laughs> man. That, that, those are big lines, man, big lines. But just another thing to add, even also in the Shere area, they found, um, grave, uh, Jewish grave sites. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, so I I forgot the area, but it's it's around Zana or Medabai Zana, mm-hmm. and uh, the, I don't remember the exact dating, but it does go it does go back many centuries. Okay. Mm-hmm. But yeah, uh, no, you got you got them all, man. Yeah, our history is like this. Is the cool thing? It's there's a negative and a positive. I try and look at it the positive way. The mm-hmm. negative is we don't know all our history, like say Italy with Rome. There's tomes and tomes and all kinds of books about Rome. Right, and they know mm-hmm. like what they ate, what they did, blah 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 blah. We don't have everything for our ancient history, but that means there's like new stuff to discover. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That's the way I try and look at it. You can go and do your research and find out cool stuff. Um, okay, so here's an interesting question someone asked When was Tigrinya first spoken? So I'll just say what I think and then and then. I'll ask you to go. I don't think there's any linguistic consensus about the relationship between Giz and Tigrinya. There's theories. Different people have different theories. Um, if I had to guess, and this is just a guess, this is not fact, please, everyone remember that. I would guess roughly a thousand-ish years ago is when the process started, but I don't think there's any point where you could clearly say is became Tigrinya. I think it's more like the chicken and the egg kind of thing. Like, what came first, the chicken or the egg? I mean, mm. this is obviously if you believe in evolution. I know not everybody here believes in that. That's, it's an analogy. Let's just think of it as an analogy. But yeah. if we look at... Um, it's a similar thing with Latin. So Latin slowly, and they know this, slowly evolved into modern-day Italian, Spanish, France, what have you. And... Um, it's it's probably a similar thing in in with Giz and Tigrinya. There is some contention amongst linguists. They say, well, written Giz doesn't seem to be the same as the Giz used in the church and as the Giz um, that we see in other. There's like different versions of written Giz. My guess mm-hmm. is we know that with Latin, they used um, the form of Latin that they had written was a very formal version that wasn't what r- regular people spoke, right? So in the, reg- the, the form that regular people spoke was called um, vulgar Latin, the Latin of the common people. Even now, think about if some historian were to read a formal paper or something that someone had and compare that to the way we're just talking right now. It's not exactly the same, right? Oh, completely different. 
So that, that's exactly what I'm saying. Uh, I can't, I am Nesrini. It slowly evolved into Tigrinya is what I think. But again, that's just my opinion. It's not, it's not necessarily a fact. Okay. Uh, uncle, tell us what you think. Yeah. So like, I'm, I'm quite uh, in agreement with what you're saying. Uh, linguistic, uh, linguistics argue whether it is, uh, evolved into Tigrinya uh, or it, it's a, a separate language that grew side by yeah. side with it along with Tigra, which is found in Eritrea. Mm -hmm. uh, the earliest evidence that we, we, we have of Tigrinya is found in Akula Guzay. Um, I don't remember the exact place, but there was a, a, like a bunch of uh, laws that were written down. So mm -hmm. we, we do have at least evidence that Tigrinya goes back to the 13th century. But I mean, with uh, linguistic laws, I mean, languages just don't kind of come out of nowhere. Yeah. Uh, I, I personally like to believe that Tigrinya kind of slowly evolved with influences from other languages and of course like with uh, people being in the country and not being literate you see a decaying of a, of a given language anywhere you go so even like the way we pronounce words even though they are similar with the Giz words I think something like 72% syntactically are the same uh, yeah. we still have um, our own twist to it so example we'll say Mangasha instead of Mangasa we'll say uh, um, example certain places we'll say Hashawi instead of Hasawi Mm -hmm. uh, we'll say nigasti instead of nigast. So it's it's probably a uh, okay. Uh, I think the Eritrean great has wrote it. Logo sarda in Akluguza in the eighth century. Is, oh uh, wow! Yeah. So, and this is just like just north of uh, Agame Auraja or Adagat. So yeah, I mean it, it's hard to say, but I, I personally believe that over time, just the decaying of Giz becomes Tigrinya, mm -hmm. as well as uh, influences from Kashari languages like Ago. As well as Afar, and poss possibly also the Saho and uh, Kunama. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So let's see what the next one is. Um, someone wanted to know about King Izana and Emperor Johannes. That's pretty broad. Um, one thing, I'll just say one brief thing because they were interesting characters. We could do a whole live about just a whole live just for Johannes and a whole live just for Izana. But. Um, one brief thing I'll say about Johannes is a lot of people don't realize is he spent years uh, fighting the Egyptians and the Italians before the Battle of Adwa, right? So he defeated the Egyptians at the Battle of Gundit and the Battle of Gura. And I believe, I don't remember whether it's Gundit or Gura, the Egyptians came to Harar to conquer Harar and they came with American and British officers and munitions and they were defeated soundly. They came again at the uh, the next battle. I think the second one was the Battle of Gura. And again, they were defeated soundly. Johannes made a deal with the British. They backed out on the deal. I think the deal was, we will allow... Oh, no, that's something completely different. I'm talking, I'll, I'll get back to that later. That's the, the, the Sudanese. Uh, this, the Italians were defeated at two big battles. The Battle of Dogali, people don't remember, and the Battle of Sahati. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that one properly. And then a bunch Sahati. of skirmishes. Okay. So how did you say it? Sahati. Okay. Um, and then there was a bunch of minor skirmishes. So before Adwa even happened, Tigray, Johannes, was, you know, giving the Italians a spanking. That's basically what I just want you guys <laughs> to know. And the person doing it under him, a lot of them, was Rasalula Abanega, who was called the Garibaldi of Africa. Garibaldi is the guy who united Italy. Italy used to be split, a lot of people don't realize this, between Milan, Venice, Sicily, the Papal States. It used to be a bunch of different statelets. And Garibaldi is the guy who united it. So when, when Rasa Lula Abanega died, Europeans wrote obituaries for him, mourning him, saying, you know, he was a great general and all this stuff. So that's how amazing this guy was, and he was from Tembia. Um... And they also defeated the Sudanese at the Battle of Kufit and the Battle of Galabat or Battle of Batam. So that's some, some interesting stuff about Emperor Johannes. And he died at the Battle of Matema because he fought with his troops. He was a real warrior. He fought in the battle and he got shot in the head. And that's kind of unfortunately what happens with, with leaders who fight directly with their troops. It happens a lot. But yeah, Ambasa, exactly. So what is there anything cool you want to say about Johannes or Izana? Uh, just with Johannes, I mean, uh, it's, it's quite unfortunate that most of us don't really uh, learn the history of uh, Johannes. There, there's a lot of slander, a lot of hate. He's usually omitted amongst the 
the foundational fathers of Ethiopia. Mm-hmm. I mean, we get the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, which is now Ethiopian Orthodox Church and Orthodox Church, because of Atsi Yohannes. Mm-hmm. There were several heresies going on throughout Ethiopia, whether it was Kabat, Tsagga, um, Zatan Malakot, Zatan Malakot, sorry. Um, you be clear, what do you mean by heresies? So these are uh, teachings that were not accepted by the church. Mm-hmm. So um, there was adoptionism, which was that Christ was adopted to be the son of God. He wasn't mm-hmm. born, uh, he, he wasn't the God that assumed flesh, which is a more Alexandrian approach to the theology of Christ. Uh, you also have uh, the unctionists who are basically saying that Christ was anointed into becoming the son of God, uh, which, is, which is very unorthodox. These were heresies that were, uh, were, that were not accepted by the church for centuries ago, actually. And were actually um, brought in, I believe, by a certain Catholic priest. I want to say Mendez, but I could be wrong. Um, and he, these uh, heresies were were quite common in many places uh, mm-hmm. throughout the, throughout the country. But um, the major faith of the church that saved from the beginning was the uh, Kara uh, Kara Tawaharu or Weldik, which was that which was basically Miaphysite theology or Miaphysite Christology. So at the uh, at the convention of uh, Boromeda, or at the at the at the meeting, or the council, sorry, um, scholars from throughout Ethiopia came to uh, came to debate, and uh, it was at that moment that um, when the debate was done, that Kara Tawaharo won the uh, won the debate and became the official faith of the church, and uh, the church became uh, from that moment on became the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawaharo Church. Oh wow! Yeah, I did not know that. Yeah. So the, these heresies were, I believe, started somewhere around the 15th century or around the Nugus Sosunius mm-hmm. and uh, with the Portuguese uh, Catholic priests coming in and teaching. So I believe that's the start of it. Okay, the Portuguese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a very interesting story as well. I can't wait to get to that. How oh, they yeah. settled around, um, what you might call it, Tigray eventually near the end. Yeah. Stuff like that. But wow, that's crazy. So the, the, the reason it's called Tewahedo is because of Johannes. Yeah. So, of course, the church was already Tawahado from the very beginning. Mm-hmm. But um, after the, uh, the split, uh, there was many different uh, controversies going on. So, you have Kara Tawahado, you have Kawat, Sagad, Zed and Malakot, and Wadaba, uh, and many other things as well. But um, the church was generally called uh, the faith or the correct mm-hmm. faith. So, Ritu the, the correct faith in Gaz. Mm-hmm. But I believe it was at that point which uh, we get the title uh, Tawahado. Okay. So the, mm-hmm. Terhas in the comments, I don't think he's saying he created Orthodox Christianity. I think he's saying he just got rid of the heresies and solidified the correct version. Yes. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, I think that's about it for the, the, the general questions. Um, we have some questions in here. I'm going to take a look at them. So if you guys want to ask some questions and put it in the, the the question box that's the easiest way to okay someone's telling me to save the live all right <laughs> um was tigray ever rich um that's an interesting question was tigray ever rich uh, do you do you want to go at this uncle um i mean if we want to talk about rich in terms of uh, being wealthy or being powerful uh we mm-hmm. can most definitely say the Aksumai uh, period was one where we were probably a superpower of the world. You get um, the Persian uh, prophet Mani, I believe yeah. in the second century, saying that Aksum is one of the four superpowers of his time. Mm-hmm. So we could assume that we were wealthy at that point. Um, we were also one of the major um, um, uh, traders in the world. Mm-hmm. So I, I like to say that Tigray means uh, or comes from the root word Tagara, which is to be a merchant. So Tigray would mean to be a merchant. So I even say like the the the, the language the Tigrinya uh, would probably be mean uh, merchant language because mm-hmm. the merchants going throughout the Red Sea and whatever came from the the highland area of uh, Tigray and Erfra. So mm-hmm. we see Aksumite coins in India, China, you name it. Uh, so it was one of, one of the most strongest economies in the world, and obviously being uh, a superpower. Uh, even words like uh, example, if you go to Kerala, which is in South India. The word for yes uh, is uwa. Uwa. Oh. Yeah. In Malayalam, which is not related to uh, this at all. Mm-hmm. So you do see that there is some cultural influence. We, we have the same traditional clothes. So it, it could either come from there or from here. Meaning the, the male traditional clothes of, uh, 
of Tigray, Eritrea, and even Amhara region, right? Mm-hmm. Um, many other things. So, I mean, we could say at that point we were rich um, and powerful. But, I mean, as time goes on, as you mentioned earlier, with erosion, um, deforestation, deforestation, farming for centuries and centuries in the same area, naturally speaking, you're going to get a degradation of, of people. So mm-hmm. that's my take uh, on it. Yeah, I would agree with everything you just said. Um, okay, wow, this is a really great question. Is Zara Jakob the first Tigray philosopher? Yes, <laughs> as far as we know. Um, he was really interesting. Um, you can find... Um, I wish there was a way to send stuff to you guys. You can find what he wrote. I think he wrote it in Giz, and it's been translated into Amharic and uh, English. So he had this like kind of paper he wrote about his life and his philosophy, his personal philosophy. And people have pointed out, there's a YouTube video I found where this guy's a philosopher and he talks about how the concepts he's talking about are concepts European philosophers started to write down, but like 200, 300 years before. Hatita, the inquiry, is that, the inquiry, is that how is that you say it? Hatita? Yeah, yeah, the hatita, yeah. Um, yeah. What, what do you know about it, uh, uncle? Uh, yeah, so I mean, with Zara Yaqob, he was a, he was an Aksumite, um traditional scholar. Um, he studied many things. Uh, he also learned under the Catholics, uh, so he kind of came to this conclusion where he doesn't really follow fall under any systematic religion, meaning like Orthodox, Catholic, or whatever. Um, he kind of criticizes all, and uh, because of the issues of the day, he ru- he runs away. I believe uh, there was a king that called him. And there was there was an issue, but he. Uh, I he, think it was an Aksumite priest. This uh, was yeah, around Aksumite the time priest, when the yeah. Portuguese. Mm-hmm. No, I think Ethiopia was technically Catholic at this point. Yes, yeah, so probably to some extent. Yeah. Yeah, and he there was a priest who was just had it in for him and said he's a he's an Orthodox heretic, blah blah blah, and so he had to run mm-hmm. away. Yeah, so he runs away to Gojam, in which a farmer asks him to start uh, writing. Uh, I think Mesmer uh, Dawit for him, and then ends up taking his son to be his student. Uh, so that that son, I believe his his name was uh, Waldehiwat or Hatehiwat. Uh, I don't remember the exact name. And even him, he continues on to to follow the same uh, school of thought. Mm-hmm. Um, exactly what he writes, I don't remember. But he, I do remember him criticizing both the Orthodox and Catholic at the time. Yeah, his stuff is really interesting. It's very like technically blasphemous under. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. His uh, the stuff he was saying was. Um, like I, I, I really like uh, this was a great question. I want to re-explore this later, but the stuff he was talking about was very logic based, and it was yes, like, yes. you know, we should be allowed to do such and such thing because God would have not put it on this earth for us to do it if mm-hmm. it wasn't. You know what yeah. I mean? Stuff like okay. that. Okay, I, th- I think he was a fallacy actually. He was a monk, I believe, and then oh, okay. he renounced his monasticism to get married. I believe that's uh, what it was, and he said. Um, to to be alone in the wilderness is not uh is not just or not right because yeah I believe there's yes. something in regards to this yeah. yes I know what you mean mm-hmm. like he said the 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 part of being human is being around people and yeah this is yeah so his his way of thinking was so interesting and unique and we're so lucky he wrote down what he thought but um yeah you could say he's the first to grind uh, scholar um let's see uh, what do you think of <laughs> I'm not getting into that. I'm sorry. Hey, Nook, I see your question. It's a little bit political. We're going to kind of skip over it. Um, can you recommend some Tigray, some books about Tigray in English? I can recommend a lot, um, but I don't know the names off the top of my head. There aren't actually, I don't think there are many books specifically about Tigray. There's some about Aksum and um, if you really want to find something about Tigray or Aksum, it's actually quite difficult for two reasons. Here, I'll get this is an interesting topic. Oh, sorry, I'm accidentally typing things. I'm trying to look at the comments. Um, so when it comes to Tigray and the history of Tigray specifically, there was for a long time, um, Tigray's history was just in culture was assumed to be the exact same as Amhara's. There was just that natural assumption they would just group us all under Abyssinians. And so 
finding any sort of ethnographical study of Tigray is really difficult, really, really difficult. I've only found, like, I think I can count on one hand the amount I've found. Um, we find many about Amharas, and then the nouveau kind of cool thing to do in the 60s, 70s, and onward was to study other parts of Ethiopia. So, you know, they like to go to the Omo Valley a lot. They like to study the Oromo. They like to study what they call the understudied uh, parts of Ethiopia, and they are. But there's a weird sort of thing where Tigray just falls through the cracks because we're assumed to be exactly the same as Amhara. So there's difficulty in finding stuff specifically about Tigray. If you want to just look up about our general history, I would recommend a site called academia.edu. Okay? That's one of the resources I use. You won't find books, but there will be papers. I usually just mm -hmm. search Tigray or something specifically I'm looking for. You can find stuff like that. Um, there's a site called JSTOR, JSTOR is what I call it. Um, it's like an academic website. You have to sign up. You can get 100 free articles a month. Um, and there's lots of amazing, interesting articles on there. And then also there's one called the Encyclopedia Ethiopica. Boy. That's it's, my dream. I'm, I'm going to try and yeah. buy that this year. Do you have it? I have, uh, I think I have some of it. Oh, my God. Get out. Yeah, I got that. Okay, yeah, I got I got this one. It's hard to find a lot of them. Some of them are are not on Amazon, but okay, yeah. yeah. Oh, I, one. I wish. Oh yeah, that has almost everything you can think about. It's it's an encyclopedia about Ethiopia. Even um, just an example, my dad was telling me all these different things about our village, the village he comes from. I found an article online because some of you can find some of the articles from the encyclopedia individually online. I found an article about my dad's village online mm. Mm. that blew my mind. And everything he told me, this is what also blew my mind. Everything he told me was written in that article. Mm -hmm. He used to talk about how they would make gunpowder. Mm -hmm. They knew how to get all the stuff from the saltpeter, the coal, all the, and they knew how to make gunpowder. And I was like, oh, okay, dad, I'm not sure. <laughs> I believe you. And then I read it and I was like, oh, wow. There's I something there. Build, yeah. yeah. It said they, they were famous for making gunpowder in Segli. I'll just say it's Segli. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I'm just sort of rambling, but um, it's hard to find stuff about our history. You really have to do a deep dive. Um, I think Febu showed that I have a Discord. Um, at some point, I'm going to see if I can try and plug the Discord with, um, and you can just go in and, and see the, the documents I have there, and you can download them for yourself. Um, okay. Um, uh, Febu wants to know I'm going to put you on blast Febu what's my likelihood of being the descendant of royalty if I'm 100% Aksum <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, not any more than anyone else in Tigray how about that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that's, that's definitely <laughs> okay so here's an interesting question I want to hear what you have to say to this uncle how did Tigrinya spread from Akhala Guzai to Tigray and other Eritreas in Eritrea? Um, if we were to assume that Tigrinya started uh, in Akhala Guzai, mm -hmm. it would probably be because uh, that would be a center for, uh, for trade, as there's two trade lines. I like to say language kind of evolves through trade. Mm -hmm. So coming from the Red Sea, anything would come from Masawa to Hamasian. And from Hamasian, you'd get a divi uh, division. You get one line going to Saraya, so you get Dawarwa, Mandefara, Adkhwala, Rama, Adwa. And Adwa, you pay your taxes. Then from Adwa, it would go all the way to Gwandar. Thus, you mm. see kind of like a cultural uh, similarity. Even with people in Gwandar, culturally are very much the same as uh, Tigrayan from Adwa, Aksum, and Shara. They're very dry, aggressive, uh, <laughs> kind of, you know, like, yeah, that, 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 that cultural affinity comes from having that same train line, uh, trade line, so people would go back and forth. Uh, even people in Sarai are known to be the, the same Let way. Let me interrupt you one second. Yeah. Febu, it's saying I have 18 seconds remaining. I don't know what that means. What, what do I got to do here? Technical difficulties, everybody. <laughs> oh, no. Let's see. <laughs> 